Welcome back to the New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and for the MSM-addicted fluoride heads who might have accidentally stumbled on this video and find it more important to comment on people's appearance than what they're actually saying, you might be interested to note that I'm wearing these funny colored glasses today because my regular glasses were broken the other day by my 15-month-old boy, and while I'm waiting for them to be repaired, I'm wearing my computer glasses, specially tinted to reduce screen glare. So now with that utterly trivial and meaningless piece of information out of the way, let's turn to world historical events. James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. And I still have this soul patch, yes. So, James, <laughs> quickly, before we're all eaten by Ebola or overrun by illegals or swallowed by sinkholes or sharks or earthquake swarms, let's look at the latest moves on the grand chessboard and our first segment this week will just be a quick kind of bullet point rundown of all of the catastrophic things going on around the world. The latest for you, Obama announces expanded sanctions against Russia as the EU aligns. The European Union on Tuesday, July 29th, overcame months of misgivings to impose a wave of tough new sanctions, economic sanctions on Russia, including an arms embargo and limits on access to European capital markets for Russian state-owned banks. James, when we discussed this, actually it was all the way back in March on New World Next Week, you see a lot of the talk and the chatter on the news, but when you actually look behind the scenes, you find out all the things that it doesn't actually affect. And a lot of this is just for the public to go, oh yeah, we're getting tough on them Ruskies. James? Uh, yes, that's true, but I see there's a definite increase in, in what's happening right now, and it seems to be snowballing. In fact, just this week, we've already had word that the U.S. is now considering sending more military intelligence aid to the Ukraine. They have just um, released an accusation that the, uh, the the Russians have violated the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty from 1987 by some sort of uh, a, a cruise missile uh, test or launch that the Russians supposedly did back in January. The Russians have responded by saying, no, we didn't do that, but I think the U.S. did. Um, so we have some tit for tat on that. Uh, we've just this week had a, the largest ever international court arbitration ruling in history um, by several dozen times. $51 billion has been uh, ordered. The Russian government has been ordered to pay $51 billion because they um, went after Yukos back in the day uh, trying to break up the the oligarchs. And, uh, and so they've now been um, ordered to pay $51 billion as a result of that. A pretty staggering sum of money. And perhaps the most worrying part of all of it is that a source close to Putin was quoted in the Financial Times saying, you know, the $51 billion, there's a war coming in Europe. Do you really think this matters? So um, every single day, there's more and more worrying signs coming out that this really is escalating quickly. And uh, again, even if they want to have a war, a hot war or not, um, all it takes is one hothead in a situation like this to set off a much bigger conflict. So uh, this is definitely something that's preoccupying me right now. And just earlier today, July 30th, as I come to you still here in the States, and this maybe gets more to the heart of it, from Reuters, Uk Ukraine economy shrinks faster as conflict takes its toll. And James, as we have been a bit off and on with New World Next Week, a little bit summer vacation, a little bit of technical difficulties, we've had another air disaster. We've not even reported on MH17. So we will include in the show notes, and again, everything we cover on these episodes will always be included in the show notes and everything you can find at newworldnextweek.com. But a link to your article slash open source investigation and thread about what really happened to MH17. So without getting super heavy into that, I found just even going down through the points and seeing... The, the members' comments and things helped me look at it in, in different ways that I maybe hadn't yet. Yes, absolutely. And and for people who haven't seen that yes, uh, yet, members of CorbettReport.com can sign in and comment on the website. So we have a very active discussion thread going on right now. I think over 150 comments at this point. And uh, a lot of people really putting a lot of work into that. So I hope people will check it out. So quickly, the remaining bullet points in our geopolitical rundown. After being warned 17 times, Israel still bombs another UN school, 20 reportedly killed this time. This earlier today, late again, Tuesday night, July 29th, Israeli artillery shells slammed into a UN-run school sheltering evacuees from the Gaza conflict early Wednesday, killing at least 20, wounding dozens as they slept, mostly, if not all, probably civilians. 
And this is not to be confused with the UN school that they blew up last Thursday, but we'll include a link to that as well. James, meanwhile, Libya is now, as RT is reporting, a failed and they are also very much on fire state as nations all around the world are abandoning their embassies in Libya. And the last note, the not a shocker at all, the Pentagon lost track of more than 40% of the weapons sent to Afghanistan. James. Absolutely. Well, the Libya, I guess, mission accomplished and uh, Afghanistan mission accomplished. Um, again, I, I don't think these are incompetence. I think this is part of the plan. This is, they're going for the order out of chaos, ultimately. And, and you create so much chaos, and sometimes it takes you generations to instill a long, deep-seated generational bit of chaos. But I think we're seeing it, which will then lead for the masses to say, please, won't you bring us some kind of order? Our second story this week, James, again, maybe not a shocker either, FBI crime lab unit rife with flawed forensics. This coming from the Washington Post, and it ties into a lot of the investigative reporting they've done into this, James. Nearly every criminal case the FBI and Justice Department have so far reviewed since launching the largest ever investigation of the FBI's crime lab unit has involved flawed forensic testimony. The problem-plagued review was triggered by a 2012 Washington Post report that FBI lab techs could have exaggerated evidence in wrongful convictions and that the review itself was marred by controversy. The FBI combed through 160 cases in the huge probe before it stopped last August, resuming now just this month after the Justice Department's Inspector General hammered officials for delays. During these long delays, the Washington Post reported three defendants were executed and a fourth died on death row, all convicted on possibly flawed forensics. The Washington Post reported that officials last August notified a first wave of defendants in 23 cases, including 14 death penalty cases, that FBI examiners exceeded the limits of science when they linked hair to crime scene evidence. And at the center of the massive review is the 10-member FBI crime lab unit that performed hair examinations for federal and state agencies and testified in cases nationwide involving murder, rape, and other violent felonies. In closing, James will note the investigation aims to review 2,600 convictions and 45 death row cases from the 80s and 90s before DNA testing of hair samples became common. We'll tie into this also a recent report from Vice Magazine and News, which is now kind of an amazing source of world news. A recent analysis by the Prison Policy Initiative shows that the U.S. is not necessarily the land of the free, but the land of the incarcerated. James? Well, uh, you're exactly right to say that this uh, story about the FBI crime lab is nothing new. In fact, back in 2012, in April 2012, the Washington Post had a story, convicted defendants left uninformed of forensic flaws found by Justice Department, talking about a wide-scale Department of Justice investigation that had found systemic flaws in FBI uh, crime in the FBI crime lab investigation of various cases back in the 90s and uh, I had at that time I had Frederick Whitehurst uh, the uh, Dr. Frederick Whitehurst the for- this former supervisory special agent in charge of the FBI crime lab um, on the program to talk about that and some of the things that he himself witnessed. Again, it's a tragedy and a travesty of justice anytime anyone is uh, is subjected to these types of uh, flawed investigations where they're ba- basically set up by the crime lab. But how much more important is it when it relates to the 1993 World Trade Center bombing and the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, as Frederick Whitehurst talked about in that interview? So we'll link it up in the show notes so that you can listen to it, including a very interesting story about how uh, Whitehurst uh, showed that the lab couldn't differentiate between a urea nitrate bomb and urine um, by actually peeing in a <laughs> in a test tube and trying to get uh, the, the crime lab to differentiate it, which they couldn't. So there you go. I mean, uh, just uh, absolutely systemic. Um, a- again, not incompetence. I think at a certain point it is corruption, and I think that's what Whitehurst was gesturing to with the uh, the WTC investigation, where they had, they had in mind what they wanted to find, and they basically found it um, one, by hook or by crook. As long as you're mentioning Oklahoma City, you just remind me. I think actually the uh, the Jesse Trinidu case has gone to trial in this past week and not getting into all that. But that goes into the dark, dirty past of 
who was involved in OKC. And I think ultimately it's trying to lead to there were more people involved. So without belaboring that, James, and again, pointing people towards the new uh, prison policy initiative, because I think it's important to kind of point out that incarceration rates in America equal those found in dictatorships and countries recovering from civil war. I think if states were nations is how the chart goes. Louisiana tops the list, and unfortunately, number eight on the list is my home state of West Virginia. But third and final segment this week, James, might count as a good news next week type of story, and this was submitted to us on Twitter by at Futures Calling Applebee's to ban tech one day a week. In a dining environment where cell phones have become as ubiquitous as bread baskets, one recent trademark filing stands out. Applebee's, the casual dining chain that serves more than a million people a day, has submitted an application for something called No Tech Tuesday. Restaurants, and I would say companies across the board, often file trademark applications before announcing programs or new items. The company declined to elaborate but said it has no concrete plans right now for No Tech Tuesday. And the spokesman got into it saying, no, we're not going to be telling people to turn their phones off and gadgets off at the table. And the company is also not changing their plan to install 100,000 tablets on every single table at more than 800 of its restaurants by the end of the year. So basically, they applied for a patent for something called No Tech Tuesday, but then say, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do anything at the stores. So whether or not this is just some social media thing they're working on, either way, the world kind of seized on it as Applebee's going to ban tech on No Tech Tuesday, which is funny because it would follow Cyber Monday, I guess. But perhaps more important than whether or not this happens, I think it's interesting on a lot of levels because you can see that as the public starts to move in some way, the corporations are ready to go, hey, we can capitalize on that. So even as we divide up in even more kind of phony little tribe-like groups, we can align ourselves with, well, I'm more of a No Tech Tuesday kind of Applebee's guy, and you know, other folks can go to Chick-fil-A to support something, but I like Coke or Pepsi, James. (laughs) I think you're exactly right about that. Um, But, I mean, I guess we can be cynical about that. Oh, the corporations are just going to jump on any trend that comes along. But ultimately, again, that speaks to the power of us. If we demand it, if we want it, they will accommodate that. So it's ultimately about us and our volition. So I'm not particularly excited about Applebee's No Tech Tuesday. I mean, you know, who cares even if that does come to fruition? It's ultimately more about the people. And it's interesting. It's an interesting cultural phenomenon, isn't it? Everyone talks about, oh, I was at a restaurant the other day and everyone had their face buried in a in a phone or a tablet um everyone kind of has that complaint and talks about it but yet it still continues to go on and it's still going to be i think a very strong cultural force for the foreseeable future as we go into the uh the trends as we stumble into the transhumanist uh, nightmare so um again this has to be be part of a, a broader cultural awakening to what is really happening and the fact that we are losing our humanity I'm not exactly holding my breath that Applebee's is going to bring that about, but, uh, but uh, uh, you know, at, at any rate, if there was a space where that, that was being uh, fostered, I think um, I would be more likely to, to uh, give my patronage to such a space, although I don't think I would ever go to Applebee's, but whatever. That's, and, and that's the catch. I think that's ultimately what, what makes it stick out for me is that we're constantly railing and 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 begging companies to do certain things for certain people and I deserve this and that when ultimately it's like who cares about Walmart or Applebee's or any of those corporate or Starbucks or what have you like why are you even going to those places anyway if we can remove it from the discussion you know it to me is is out of sight out of mind but having said that and having qualified that as somewhat of a good news next week story, there's a couple of other good news stories we've missed recently. One from today, actually, and submitted to us by our friend at G.J. Salisbury. Buffalo, Missouri residents vote to end fluoridation by a 70 percent margin. Meanwhile, Monsanto begins compensating West Virginia victims of dioxin exposure. Wisbro Green becomes the first village in the U.K. to fight off fracking. California removes the ban on Bitcoin and other alternative currencies. 
And lastly, Jesse Ventura just yesterday won a $1.8 million defamation case against the late Navy SEAL. So whether that's an unmitigated positive remains to be seen. But, James, we always want to mention that we want folks' story ideas as well, and they can submit them using hashtag New World Next Week on Twitter. That's exactly right. And I think let's uh, get out and not overstay our welcome. So um, thank you again for these stories. Thanks so much, man. Take care.